So I'm happy to introduce you to your um, session presenters uh, this morning, at least this morning where I am. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Ayers, who is the L. Bevel Jones III Professor of Religious Education at Candler School of Theology and Emory University. Jennifer's research interests include practical theological approaches to education and formation, ecological religious education, pedagogical theory and practice, theories and pedagogies of place, and story-centered approaches to education. She is the author of three books, most recently, Inhabitants, Ecological Religious Education. Her current research develops a narrative pedagogy for ecological and spiritual formation. I would also like to introduce you to Eliana A. Rum Ku, who is Assistant Professor of Homiletics at the Graduate School of Practical Theology in South Korea. Dr. Ku's research explores diverse themes such as lament, hospitality, post-colonial feminist hermeneutics, epistemic justice, and narrative ethics. Dr. Ku is the author of the book, Lament Driven Preaching, Proclaiming Hope Amid Suffering. Her recent research includes uh, the articles, Lament, Hospitality, and Living Together with Our Children, Challenging Texts with Violence Toward Women, and Toward an Asian Decolonial Christian Hospitality. Additionally, her recent work explores the intersection between fashion and preaching. Pretty cool. Um, so uh, we are, here's how this is gonna go. Um, our two presenters are gonna present in succession. Um, so you'll hear from Dr. Ayers for about 20 minutes, and then you'll hear from Dr. Ku for about 20 minutes, after which there will be um, a period for conversation and question and answer. Uh, so at this point, I'm happy uh, to uh, welcome Dr. Jennifer Ayers. Um, Jennifer, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Anne. Um, I was talking and had not yet unmuted myself. <laughs> so good morning um, from Atlanta and um, let's get going. In 2006, former Vice President Al Gore wrote and starred in a documentary film about global warming and the coming environmental crisis. The film was an illustrated and enhanced production of a climate talk Gore had been giving um, Gore had been giving in front of every audience that would hear him pro propelled by PowerPoint slides. He estimated that he had presented more than a thousand times. The film was called An Inconvenient Truth and it told a hard and scary truth about the collision course the planet was on. The film gave a good boost to the environmental movement in the U.S. at the time and provide, proved prescient on many of its predictions. Gore and his team banked on the premise that if people knew the truth about the data, they would change their behavior. I spent about now probably eight or nine years thinking about ecological education in a religious key, about how to nurture people of faith and ecological consciousness. And here is another inconvenient truth. And that is that in the last 60 years of environmental education in the United States, a pedagogical emphasis on the mastery of climate science data and a subsequent ethical emphasis on individual action, culpability and guilt has dominated, omitting attention to the construction of an ecological identity or collective political action. And the outcome has been tragic individual and collective ecological despair and denial, individuals and communities frozen in ecological grief, guilt, and alienation. Aldo Leopold worried about this possible outcome, that one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. 
And the truth is the wounds are real. Apocalyptic images of desolation, conflict, and humanitarian crises abound, rendering optimism naive. In some circles in theological education, we're talking about preparing the planet's hospice chaplains. And yet there is still living to do. Here is another part of the truth cast in theological terms. God is still breathing life, even into suffering communities and bioregions, breathing life into God's own body, the planet. Religious education must then offer learners an open-eyed understanding of the ecological and social crises pressing in upon us, but it must also inspire and encourage them, offering a wellspring of theological wisdom for a future with hope, a future of living in harmony with an aching and dying planet. In this paper, I am trying to offer a more capacious, creative, and theological conception of truth and the possibility that creative and imaginative pedagogies of place and narrative might have the power to nurture ecological identity. Could we tell the truth of ecological being in a different, belonging in a different voice? Truth lies in the mysterious process of discovery. Here, didactic education is perhaps not up to the job. We need pedagogical practices that invite learners into this mysterious process of discovery. This reminds me, of course, of what Emily Dickinson said about the power of the poetic with regard to truth. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Camille Dungy, nature writer, poet, and author of last year's beautiful book, Soil, the Story of a Black Mother's Garden, writes about this poem's central claim, saying that poets introduce fundamental truths in ways that readers can carry with them, ways that won't be so alarming that a reader will refuse to accept the poem's vision of the world. It's a way to force us to pay more careful attention to the world we think we already know. Telling the truth slant is necessary. In my work over the last several years, alongside environmental philosophers and theologians and ethicists, alongside pedagogical theory and reports on water and climate and food and environmental justice, I have read and even tried my hand at creative nonfiction nature writing. I don't know how else to say it except to say that that work saved me. So this year I've been delving into some place-based writing, nature writing, and the pedagogical implementation of both reading and writing in this genre. That's what this paper is about. You might've read my whole paper. You might've given up in a rage when you realized I had cheated the system and put nearly an entire paper's worth of text in the footnotes. I apologize. This uh, work I've been, um, doing for several years and um, presented some version of an early version of this research at the IAPT meeting last summer in Seoul. But let me now summarize some of the key claims that this paper makes. First, I identify the cultivation of e imagination as the, ped the pedagogical task for nurturing Christian hope in the midst of climate crisis and environmental injustice. Hope requires a creative reach for an unrealized truth, a leap into the unknown. Imagination appropriate to an ecologically grounded Christian hope thus is always reaching from a place towards something new, something more. That something more may be a transformative experience of recognition through imagination, we might apprehend the interconnected web in which we live, something that without imagination, we cannot see, or perhaps more to the point, feel. 
So how do we do this? Educational practices that nurture both theological and ecological imagination have the power to reframe identity and nurture Christian hope, even in the face of ecological crises, perhaps especially there. In this paper, I focus on place-based and narrative pedagogy. So first, a word about place-based pedagogy. David Orr has argued that to have a sense of place is to have a competent and knowledgeable affection for a specific locality. Relatedly, Yifu Tuan coined the term topophilia to describe the affective bond between people and place or setting. And I find this um, to be in somewhat intention with some of what you had in your paper, Eliana, so I'll be interested to talk about that. But it can't be the sense of place. It cannot be simplistic or romanticized. Experiences of displacement and dislocation are central to the lived experience of many persons and communities, whether those experiences be chosen, a byproduct of broader political and economic changes, or the designs of a deliberate program of forced migration and alienation. Even so, Mitchell Thomas Show argues that place still matters because it's important to nurture feelings of rootedness and stability, even and perhaps especially in a world of dynamic change. In fact, our anthropologist Arturo Escobar argues that embedding place-based, place-conscious communities in transnational networks is necessary work in the context of exploitative global capitalism. Thus, it is an essential component in any pedagogical intervention that seeks to link the hard work of loving a particular place with the intervention that seeks, I'm sorry, with the expansive and amorphous work of addressing global ecological challenges. In part, we do this by nurturing what Thomas Show calls constructive connectivity, which he defines as Understanding and understanding of social and ecological networks demonstrates the relationship between the two and promotes creativity and innovation by building relationships among diverse clusters. From this focus on a networked understanding of place, I then turn to narrative, observing that if place is a location layered with meaning, we largely know the meaning of that place. Sorry, let me advance one more slide. If place is a location layered with meaning, we largely know the meaning of that place through the personal, familial, or even cultural stories we, that we tell and hear about it. Next, narrative is revelatory. Scholars in our own field like Ann Wimberly and Tom Groom and Mary Hess um, and scholars in womanist theology and ethics, Melanie Harris, Katie Cannon, Yolanda Pierce, have demonstrated forcefully that narrative is revelatory. It's revealing, however, is not linear or didactic or obvious. Narrative can host a provocative set of paradoxes, as well as elements of self-discovery, experiences opening up to mystery, or even mystical knowing. It is thus a site of personal agency and the power to imagine otherwise. In writing, hearing, and sharing stories, we encounter truth. Natalie Goldberg observes that the process of writing can often bring students to tears. And she says, that is okay. I encourage them to keep reading or writing. Don't stop at the tears, go through to truth. In writing, in the practice of writing, we find our way to truth. Hearing stories is also a means to encounter truth, truth told slant. Ada Maria Asasi Diaz writes, people do not live or die for a creed or belief. They need narratives that have the capacity to move hearts. When we are moved by a story, she says, we get invested. Finally, it's important to note that the writing and hearing of stories is interactive. It is a practice of sharing whereby we build an interdependent web. Our stories intersect in deep and sometimes surprising ways, challenging and strengthening each other. When those stories are about place or experiences of being displaced or multi-placed, they offer an opening for imagining 
a network of sacred and loved people, communities, and places. So in conclusion, I want to share with you a little bit of what this um, educational practice is. Um, I thought it might be helpful for you to be able to see this. So I want to offer this brief case study of connectional place-based digital storytelling as an exercise in eco-theological imagination and a bridge pedagogy, perhaps, between intensely localized place-based approaches and the need for transnational movement for ecological protection and flourishing. The written and digitally produced story. So I use this exercise in my class, religious education in our ecological context. And I've um, taught it for several years now and included this assignment each time. The Digitally produced stories that the students create, they're little mini documentaries, three to four minutes each, um, using images and um, a narrative that they work on in small groups in story circles over a period of weeks. These stories demonstrated the power of place, but also the experiences of displacement or fragmentation and students' sense of belonging and identity. The most important observation I want to make, I say a lot more in the paper about this assignment is how it expands what counts as nature or place-based writing. As Laurie Savoy and Allison Deming observe, why is there so little recognized nature writing by people of color, they ask. To define nature writing as anything that excludes these experiences does not reveal a lack of writing, but instead reflects a societal structure of inclusion and exclusion based on othered difference, whether by race, culture, class, or gender. The student stories um, um, embodied this. I've been making this assignment for several years, but had begun to worry that this inward looking practice of writing stories of place were maybe too localized, too intimate, I wondered if they might not be enough for the task of transforming how humans relate individually, but more important, collectively, to the life of the planet, to the global environmental movement. The stories alone, individually, did not quite tell the whole truth. So I added two elements to the storytelling, asking students to explicitly tend the rhizomatic network that linked their stories. As students heard the final versions of each other's stories, they were asked to make notes about thematic linkages they saw between this, that story and their own, generative themes and locations, even shared feelings or relationships. They then located their own stories on an online map. So I'm gonna stop sharing and switch over to a different tab now so I can show you the map that they created. Okay. So this is the map that they created. The first thing that you can see immediately is almost everyone in the class had a story that somehow centered in the Southeast United States. Um, not all though, there were a couple that were in the Southwest. So you can see those kind of there and you can see the um, links that they drew. So I asked them to draw links on this map um, to at least two other stories from their story to two other stories showing what they understood the link to be. We had one international, two international students in the class, um, one from Korea and one from Malaysia. The student uh, from Korea actually wrote a story about his experience in Toronto. Um, but the student from Malaysia talked about, wrote her story about um, leaving Malaysia to come study in the United States. So, and I'll ask you, Anne, if you don't mind just to pause the recording for a moment. Thank you, Anne. So I'll just end with um, that love story um, that a student wrote to her neighborhood park, to her family's dog, um, and to just um, welcome the space that creative nonfiction writing um, offers to deal with the complex emotions of what it means to be an eco ecological being. I know my time is up, so I will stop there. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We will have time at the conclusion of both presentations for conversation with Jennifer. 
Um, uh, but now I would like to introduce you to Eliana Ku, who will share her presentation with us. Um, firstly, I want to thank Jennifer for her presentation. Um, suffering and life are complex, so should be hope be. <laughs> and the narrative of life is so powerful and crosses the boundary of our experience and invites others to participate. So thank you. Um, I'm a um, homiletician, but I first participated in RA four years ago and fell in love <laughs> with it. So, um, and have been uh, presenting for three years <laughs> now. <laughs> I enjoy the um, discussion with people and, and lack of pressure to do something here. So I really love REA. <laughs> um, Homiletitians are usually boring and serious, so <laughs> I hope <laughs> you can understand. <laughs> so uh, let me share my presentation. Okay, um, my, uh, my research is related to understanding the relationship with other. I want to discuss um, religious education, need to reinterpret and expand to include a broader thinking of relationality that responds to the need of different non-human beings, including the marginalized. Um, Insensitivity and a refusal to respond to the world are related to a failure to meaningfully consider the multiple relationship and dependencies between ourselves and banishing others. This also means um, an unwillingness to see the reality of a suffering that has befallen more species, including humans, or a refusal to lament and respond to the being who have this, um, disappeared. So through lament, religious education may adopt an approach that resists the urge to fix um, the wounded planet situation beyond acquire insights and skills to just manage or cope with our suffering. We do relearn how to cultivate a vision and a lifestyle, a will that live together. So I want to talk about uh, ecological sensitivity beyond uh, human-centric understanding of ecology, considering sympoesis and Yomur, its Korean philosophy. Um, Haraway's advocating for multi-species making with is employed to explore relational ways of understanding and cohabiting. This concept find resonate, res, resonance in Karen Bard's notion of entanglement, wherein Bard views in the universe as interconnected within a single living nature. The ontology of this entanglement is under, an understanding that we are not contained in nature like a box, but um, that our identity is itself unstable, differentiated, and um, dispersed. So epistemolo epistemology and ontology are inseparable as we gain knowledge, not from the from an um, external world, but because we are inherently part of it. Um, so Yomur is traditional Korean philosophy. It posits the human nature and all entities are fundamentally identical under natural laws. This philosophy seeks to um, um, perceive beings and things as belonging to the same ca category, implying that our existence and life are intertwined with all things on the earth. 
So what is distinctive about Yomu by connecting love, compassion, and respect for life for things uh, with the thought that all things are essentially equal? So Yomu expresses a profound empathy for the unseen and the vulnerable. This pathetic attitude expanded to inanimate objects as well. Uh, for instance, um, when the leg of E. Kubo's desk broke, he wrote a poem expressing his existential solidarity and symbiosis with the desk, um, suggesting they were co-sufferers and saved each other. So this notion that humans and things um, collaboratively creating and preserve life together. So this attitude of no Everest is uh, integrate in integrate integrated with an understanding of equality of life and death between oneself and other beings. All with lament for um, those who do not experience this equality, uh, whether human, animal, or inanimate object. So um, about um, biblical scripture, um, in eight, I found two things. I want to point out two things. Uh, first one is um, lament of the invisible. Lament causes us moving beyond mere emotional attachment when we empathizing with the suffering of another being. This is crucial as lament that excludes the unknown other can impede our ability to coexist with all beings. By questioning the hypothesis um, that animals do not uh, comprehend the death, Tom von Duren challenges human exceptionalism, the notion that humans understand death fundamentally differently um, from the rest of nature and other animals. For organism, um, the natural flow of, of all of what appears to be selfish survivor involves a self-abandonment for the sake of future generation, allowing us to imagine individual organism as um, emitting, flowing, and contributing to the larger system of a uh, species. As a part of this ecosystem, it must be contributed by becoming part of other organisms or through sharing. So um, Roman um, chapter eight, verse 21 describes creation as bearing its own burdens, longing and lamenting for its own liberation, elevates them on equal status with human before God. So long, um, verse 2 to states that the uh, interdependence between human and all members of the created order implies a shared experience of helplessness of, and suffering, a common fate of death, and a shared hope for salvation from that a state of bond state of bondage. So I also found um in um Roman chapter 8, Lament of God. Creation does not um, originate solely from nothing. It involves creation from effort and creation through labor. Care is added to cause, interest to movement, and effort to energy. The suffering of God the Creator, who entered into creation to bear the life of human beings and of creation, is intertwined with the suffering of humanity and creation. This suffering illustrates that all life is obtained through the recurring struggle, paid through giving, hunting, and loving passion. Thus, Jesus is the pinnacle of the nature order, as um, since the beginning of the time, many creatures have uh, given up their lives as a ransom for others. In this respect, reading Lomis A as a call to embody recipro um, reciprocity through interacting and intergiving responds to um, the need within some part of the Bible for an open view of humanity, life, the world, and the relationship between God and all things. 
allowing for questioning, reaffirmation, and a construction of new understandings. Um, so I, I, I would suggest at some point to preach um, uh, with a dual track, like how to um, interrupting and how to uh, inter intergiving. Um, so uh, first one is um, so the, the space of preaching can also serve as a place where individuals and communities confront deaths and lo loss um, collectively and respect on our law in addressing the suffering of the planet, epistemological and empathetic performance. So um, first one is um, epistemological performance of inter -empting. So one way to understand practice lament as interrupting is to recognize a particular kind of shared world or shared life as a way of being, involving a conscious process of learning and changing to accommodate a transformed reality. This is possible through emptying what we had recognized because lament is about um, realizing the need to renew our perceived relationship. So um, I want to talk about first um, human-centric linear epistemology. The roots of anthropo uh, anthropocentrism are deeply intertwined with the narratives of violent domination by those who consider themselves the superior species. Slow and complex structures of violence reveal that um, environmentalism is an indispensable um, ally of the socially and systematically deprived. So we cannot address the climate crisis without considering the effect of colonial um, regresses or the consequences of racism, sexism, not to mention uh, poverty. We also um, um, need to recognize the relationship between climate change and creation of large numbers of ecological refugees and then um, heightened the vulnerability of poor women and children. So intentional lament for ecosystem can therefore help the participants of um, preaching perceive the climate crisis in a multifocal way, blurring boundaries between categories of power and privilege. Um, second thing is um, passive listener-centric epistemology. Um, here is interesting uh, research. In data from a multi-year survey of mainline Protestant clergy in the United States, uh, the percentage of preachers addressing climate uh, and environment issues has been um, steadily increasing. But 90% um, of preachers reported delivering at least one sermon on creation in the past 12 years, but only 31 per, uh, of per participants said they remembered hearing such a sermon during the same period. Um, according to a 2022 20, um, study by a Pew Research Center, uh, six, uh, 60 63 of American adults who regularly attend the service of a major Protestant uh, denomination reported hearing little or no discussion of climate change in sermons. So <laughs> based on these researches uh, and, and the uh, um, PRC research, uh, Leah shared a uh, hypo hypo uh, hypothesis that reason for this gap, um, preachers and no, sermon participants are related to differences in uh, perception of actual interest in climate and environment issues in um, varying levels of concern. One of the reasons is climate issues tend to be perceived more as a political issue, not a religious issue. So um, religious education can help bridge this gap 
which is often uh, widened by uh, differences in expectation and understanding of environment concerns within religious communities by providing more rerunning opportunities, raising awareness through campaigns, a book reading, something, dialogue, so on, fostering personal reflection. Um, so third amp uh, emptying is um, uh, related to intimate, intimate, in, intimateness centric epistemology. Preaching can disrupt family, family, familiarity to recognize and lament with the states of death in life. Death in life is um, Judith Butler's word. Um, I, I explained here, so you can uh, refer to my uh, presentation page. So in uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, I I think you know, um, she is a really famous uh, preacher in North America. So in her sermon on uh, Levit uh, Leviticus um, chapter 25, um, she challenges our conventional notion of land ownership. She said this commandment is not merely about productivity. It is about boundary. Taylor describes that in the seventh year, neither the owner of the land nor servant nor flowing oxen nor the wild jackals are bound to their doors and every is free to forage their hearts their heart content and walk through the garden in the cool of the evening without toil no one chases away um strange animals or herb anything to one's own barn. The land is of hungry wildlife. So um, Taylor envisions a world where there is no distinction between um, haves and have not, where um, forest, vineyard, and fields are respected as God's creation, equal to human who have traditionally held control. So hope is not simplistic. The complex of hope, which is a state of tense and anxious openness toward a future that is different from the current state. An openness to sharing in the suffering creation and participating in the all-encompassing communion of suffering that is inherent in the ongoing process of annihilation that all creation must experience. And the last thing is uh, Christianity-centric epistemology. Um, ecological sensitivity calls us to be an ethical community, defined in broader terms than religious community, and requires us to rethink the boundaries of a community in innovate um, ecologically more holistic ways. So most world religions addresses, ad address the interrelationship between human nature and divine, and all have the potential to positively um, influence ecological uh, practices. Religious religions possess both direct and indirect resources, such as prof prophetic voices, claims to just just notion of uh, revelation, rituals, symbols, and sacred languages, which can be um, directed toward ecological su sustainability. So um, the last part is um, uh, giving. So I also suggest the four givings. The uh, first one is, um, Oh, as I mentioned before, faith and practice are not um, converging in terms of ecological sensitivity, but remain separate. Um, this gap implies that uh, religious cohorts may make sacrifice and deprive themselves to care for the survivors of natural disasters and response to ecological crisis. And yet, they may not recognize how their own way of life influenced by their faith contribute to the root causes of their Christ crisis. So first giving is vulnerability. We need to seek an ontology that overcomes the illusion of um, autonomous subject. 
advocating for an ethic um, enabled and performed by other, an ethic that does not rely on um, coercive uh, regulation or law, but makes our um, life vulnerable. So this, this approach reaches um, meritocracy of self-growth by fostering an understanding of ourselves as inherently vulnerable and in, in interdependent. Second giving is um, related to the struggles of spirit. Lament uh, or lamentation is not a flight to God. Lamentation represents intergiving in the struggle of new creation. Um, you know, um, the act of Lamat when delivering um, childbirth. Um, so um, use divine mat. If we breathe into our pain, breathe through our pains, the birth of new becomes possible. The woman in delivering gives her body to life um, and is uh, sensitive to the cry of life, the new life. So this resonates with the uh, intergiving, with the cycle of life in the entire universe and longs for um, a post, um, apocalyptic new creation. This lament is not disappear, but um, a longing that draws hope. This but this hope, however, is not comfortable consolation, but uh, struggling hope. Um, third one is uh, the vision of a body. If we acknowledge that the whole earth is the body of God, our spirituality must ground it in our relation to the human and more than human world that we have inhabit. It must involve capacity for horizontal um, transcendence, uh, namely our ability both to transform experience and to be transformed ourselves by something that transcends us. The whole ongoing, ever developing natural process of uh, which we are a part. Here, hope can be understood as an uh, undeserved um, experience of uh, transformative growth, despite the shortcomings of our personal or communal effort to improve the world. So, hope represents a uh, commitment to the life with others, opening to the potential to move beyond the self centered need and desire toward respecting and caring for others and environment. So the last thing is um, related to empathy for network mutuality. Um, biblical scholars have long noticed the pattern of core and response in the uh, creation story of Genesis chapter one. Throughout the six days of creation, God said, let there be more than a dozen times. The let be form implies um, empowerment rather than command. So rhetoricians observe that this language invites the created order to participate in creation with God. So being in the likeness of God involves empowering the being around us to act freely. It is an act of empathy, participating in other beings' desire. If the empathy of other beings flows through I, and I um, relativ uh, relativize myself to include their empathy, the grief of existence, including that of the, the earth, is not um, repressed, but um, integrated to a broader and richer tapestry of lamentation. Um, I think, yeah, thank you for listening. I can wrap up here. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Eliana. So we have time now for conversation. Um, I wonder if, uh, before we open the conversation to the whole group, if there are, um, if, if there's any conversation you would like to have with one another, Jennifer and Eliana, about points of convergence, connections, discoveries, um, points of divergence that have helped um, illuminate your own thinking or thinking about practice. So I invite you all to 
converse with one another for a few minutes before we open the floor. Eliana, I don't mind going first since you just finished. Um, maybe you'd like to rest for just a moment, but um, two things are immediately apparent to me after reading your paper, which was so excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, one was that we share a sense that um, sort of ecological identity and responsibility is seated in the emotional um, in this in the affections that um, we need to tend the emotional connection that we feel or don't feel um, with other aspects of creation. And I think um, I really appreciated the way in which you framed that in ways, in some ways that connected with my own thinking on these questions in some ways challenged. One way that it challenged me um, and something that I've really been wrestling with, I'm not quite sure um, how to think about it is loving the invisible, loving the um, aspects of creation that um, with with which we do not share intimacy. Um, so when you say giving up the um, intimacy um, centric approach, this really challenges place-based thinking. Um, and um, I appreciate the challenge. And uh, it's it got me kind of thinking about what are the educational practices that might nurture an emotional commitment or response to those things more than human life, other aspects of creation that might otherwise be invisible. So thank you so much for that um, and for your whole paper. Um, thank you for your response, Jennifer. Um, this is quite a paradox. <laughs> How to love in visible and <laughs> You know, that thing is we only love and mourn what we are attached to and love to. But as this Potero says, all things can be mourned. They, they, um, they deserve all things, I think, all beings reject to um, be lamented. So this is the point that I want to mention. <laughs> I thought your use of um, Judith Butler's thinking on that question is really helpful. Okay, thank you so much. Other um, conversation from the room. Um, we welcome your insights and comments, um, please just remember to unmute before you speak. Yes, Beth Nolan, Elizabeth Nolan. Hi. Yes, we will confuse people, won't we, the other Beth? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I was fascinated by the Yomo uh, notion and by um, Lee from uh, the the 12th century and just reminded of how much our Indigenous peoples from around the world have similar concepts of the interrelatedness of all things. And I kind of wonder when did uh, Western uh, thought uh, do this separation out of the dominance of humans over the rest of creation because, you know, obviously in scripture, um, in the Psalms as well as uh, in in Romans 8, as you've uh, pointed out, Eliana, uh, that that all creation uh, is together in, in this process. Uh, so I'm, I'm appreciative particularly uh, for that... Uh, reminder of our Indigenous uh, connections and how we can do it. And I, I find the way that you've written the paper is is almost yin-yang. <laughs> of, of, and and I, I just find it so embodied uh, culturally 
uh, in in what you've been doing. It's very complex. Um, and and thank you for all the work that's um, gone into it in terms of scholarship. But to hold up the importance of lament and of the potential of what that means to uh, to feel with uh, creation and and to also understand uh, from a uh, homiletical preaching uh, position uh, just just how important that. Uh, holding of the truth of life in death and of of uh, life through death uh, that that is uh, of course essential for for Christians uh, in their understanding of this so thank you for uh, that movement and uh, Jennifer uh, I was fascinated by the the digital process and so thank you for uh, explaining that process and for again for all of your scholarship too it's really great to uh, to hear of what's going on in other parts of the world thank you um someone can um explain me when <laughs> when some people think <laughs> started to think in that way but I was looking I think um you know more about the West um, in fact many people like many ancient people in Korea and in um, Near Eastern um, people um, similar thinking about like related to Yomur uh, philosophy uh, but uh, Iyubo is very special because he added to the concept of lament and com confession um, with this concept like quality um, with all beings. So I really fascinated this concept, uh, Iyubo's concept especially. Thank you for your comment, um, Elizabeth. I'll come back uh, if that's all right, uh, Anne. Um, I'm just responding to what what are the uh, or or when did Westerners do this division? Um, and I wonder whether um, part of uh, you know I'm, I don't like doing it. But I'm wondering whether it's it's more part of a particular form of. Uh, theology, a more evangelical sense of theology, uh, and and to do with capitalism uh, in the sense of, you know, you will have dominion over, uh, and that that sense of the earth is is ours to uh, enjoy, um, and and I find I'm sorry, <laughs> I find the kind of American um, telling evangelist stuff uh, of the um, the 70s through uh, to the 2000s, probably I, I'm not familiar with it anymore. Uh, but just that that sense of entitlement that is still part of our, our Western societies and and political groups. Um, but it, it it's such a a heresy, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I want I want to stand up with. Uh, um, Maria Harrison and say stop, stop, you know, <laughs> this is wrong. Uh, religious educators uh, as well as all of the other preachers, etc., uh, have the responsibility to point out the heresy just as uh, in South Africa, uh, you know, finally uh, the apartheid was uh, decried. Now, anyway, I, I think what we're doing here in this conference is is helping to say stop. There's a there are multiple other ways to do it, but it seems to me that we're on the same um, same theme of uh, how we together uh, understand that all of us are part of God's good creation. Um, just as I started talking, a hummingbird just came outside my window, so that's the first one I've seen this summer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, 
I, I do want to say, like, for me, I've been really helped, Elizabeth, by some feminist um, philosophy and environmental philosophy on this question. Scholars that have helped me a lot have been um, Carolyn Merchant, The Death of Nature, Lorraine Code, Ecological Thinking, and Val Plumwood. I read an essay by her. Um, I can't remember the name of her book. I'm sorry at the moment. But all of them kind of trace this thinking back. I mean, sure, evangelical um, theology has participated in it in the United States, um, but really mo a lot of theology in the United States has participated in this. And a lot of um, philosophers trace it back to um, Francis Bacon and Descartes and others who really had this objectivist, I mean, Parker Palmer talks about the objectivist myth of knowing, um, and that can really be traced back to enlightenment thinking, which... Um, and Lorraine Code really has also a wonderful um, systemic analysis of it in which she says the mind that is looking for a taxonomy for everything will also taxonomize people. And so the, just this kind of desire to objectify the other, um, to connect with Eliana's paper, goes from everything to microorganisms to other human beings and, um, and how we understand ourselves to be separate. So I'm not saying anything that you don't already know, I'm sure, but I just wanted to put that in the conversation. I wanna jump in here and connect a theme that I'm seeing emerging. I have the unusual experience of going to everything in this meeting because I'm the co-program chair. And so I just wanna pull through a thread of something that I heard in yesterday's, um, and my caffeine is just kicking in, so it may be over enthusiastic. So I'm trying to remember to keep my, you know, my Tim hat on and uh, not be hopeful. I'm just seeing a connection between Maureen O'Brien's paper yesterday. She talked about ecological conversion and I'm experiencing a deepening of my ecological conversion, moving me from deep curiosity about my innate sense of animism to an approach that Eliana is really helping me with here, this phrase of loving the invisible. And that connects with yesterday's plenary in which uh, Deborah Rinstra, Daniel Four, and Melanie Harris gave this really uh, broad and beautiful and nuanced and intricate conversation around, uh, from Melanie Harris's perspective, the African cosmology in which spirit, if only spirit, human, and earth are healed, if all three are not part of the conversation, then there's not going to be any sense of healing. And she said, all three energies must be healed. Um, only then can we can only do that if we talk to trees <laughs> and if one knows the songs outside one's own culture. I just thought that was beautiful. Daniel also um, echoed that when he said about an ecological effort to be in uh, in you know to, in a neighborhood. Has anyone stopped to greet the trees directly? Has anyone asked the stream how it feels? And I'm just sensing that we are in a time in this ecological movement when unless we are capable of stepping out of and learning from our sibling spiritual traditions, um, we're really stuck. And I'm feeling the sense of hope in that as we move out of our traditions to remember what Daniel called uh, the animist ethic that existed, that God interrupted in almost all of our traditions, this animus it, um, ethic existed, but got interrupted. And uh, I've really appreciated the work. Oh gosh, his name is going to escape me. First name, Mark, when God was a bird. Um, uh, does anybody remember his last name? I'll put it in the chat. When God was a bird is a really beautiful systematic uh, theology examining the Judeo, the Jewish and Christian uh animism, you know, how, how it exists in those canons and lifting it up and celebrating it. So just tying those threads through. I will also mention that I'm starting a Google Doc and I'm putting it in the Padlet. I would love, Jennifer, the, the, for you to lift up those three things you just said. You know, you, you've given us a beautiful bibliography, but if each person presenting lifted up the two or three uh, resources that you just wouldn't want us to not have at the tip of our tongues, that that would be really helpful going forward. So that'll be a doc that anyone can enter into um, to share resources and uh, let us know your favorite little 
essays that may not show up in the midst of the beautiful bibliographies that you've presented here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Van Meter, would you like to join the conversation? Thank you all. I, I want to say these are two really beautiful papers, and I'm deeply appreciative of the work that y'all brought here. And I um, was in one session yesterday that was also just profound. I find myself confusing my own self on time because I live in Eastern and now I'm in Central. So I've arrived for the last three minutes of at least two other sessions <laughs> in the midst of this. But um, really found this profoundly beautiful. And um, I think tomorrow will be the, I think the fourth, but definitely the third time I presented at REA slash APRI on ecology. And um, the first in the 90s, and then the 2000s and 2010s. And it's just deeply, just deeply appreciative of the theme of this conference because it 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 is essential and has been essential for quite some time. I, I want to add something to the conversation about where do we lose this? Tim Eberhardt, I don't know if he's published it yet, but I've seen him do a couple times a pretty remarkable lecture on um, how the Romanization of the church uh, affected his kind of Germanic heritage around animism as well as the Celtic heritage around animism and how this kind of separation of, uh, of soul from earth and an animistic view um, has roots even back into the 12th, 13th, 14th century and earlier. And so some of that work there. But I just, um, more than anything, these are two really wonderful papers. Jennifer, I, I think about, um, I don't wanna to say too much because I wanna save some of it for tomorrow, but I think about um, the presentation we did maybe eight, 10 years ago and I think there were some, some uh, accurate critiques of that, um, that we, we were a bit too romantic in, in that. I, and it stuck with me a while to try to ground this. But I, I just want to say I am hopeful. I'm just not hopeful for humans. <laughs> I'm very hopeful for the planet. Um, and I, I'm hopeful for the possibilities of resilient communities. But I'll say more different times. I'm looking forward to that, Tim. That was a great plug for, for uh, tomorrow's plenary with Tim Van Meter and Heber Brown. I also want to plug the one that's coming later this morning with Randy and Edith Woodley um, at bringing their uh, indigenous perspective. Other comments, Any um, anyone else in the room, would you like to join the conversation? Anjin? Yeah, and thank you so much for beautiful papers and Jennifer's and Aliena, Adam. So first of all, I appreciate the Jennifer's papers and presentations. I remember that I took your class and I made my, uh, Place the based narrative, <laughs> so it's a it's a really good reminder for me to understand how to connect to my uh, sense of the belonging in my hometown and the nature. But now I'm studying, as you know, like studying in the U U.S. and then thinking about the how to transnational perspective to connect to the place based pedagogies and practice and. Uh, I'm thinking that so the international like experience and and also like traditional experience and the tour experience. For example, I visited the Ghana the last three months ago. How to connect to the just the trend some like not long term to like stay in the one place. But at the same time, we have a lot of the trouble to visit a different place to connect to the understanding ourselves, how to understand about the transnational place-based pedagogy and practice. And I also remember, I also know that the, you visiting the soul as well. So what is your experience like 
when you within the soul and how to understand about the ecological awareness and imagination. And also I have a, another question for Eliana. So I very excited to bring to the your move in the Korean philosophies. And actually as a Korean, it's I I didn't I didn't know that about how to connect the my practice into the Korean cosmologies. So do you have any specific examples in Korean context to understand the ecological sensitivity? Thank you. Jennifer, you want to respond first or? Um, why don't you go first? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, practice is always, <laughs> um, when I said, uh, that, um, we um, should listen to those around us and be open to other ideas or views. One student asked me what what colors we should look at and <laughs> which book um, should be um, read, but uh, should be written. So um, I found uh, this interesting question um, is related to too much how do I say too much scholarly thinking? <laughs> because I I intended first I I, I told them, um, how do I say just um, an eternal encounter can start with just say hello to a child who is um, playing late on the playground, and the same seems to uh, be true. So we have to spend maybe in preaching, we have to spend three days at our desk and three days outside prepare for a sermon, which means we need to say hello to trees. <laughs> so it seems to me that it is um, the smallest of actions that can bridge the gap between awareness and action, um, regardless of its Korean philosophy or Western philosophy. Just we need to like reduce this gap, how to aware and how to act. So smallest action is key part in life, I think. Thanks, Eliana. That was a wonderful response. And Jen, I'm also thinking about your um, little side note that you made about travel and exposure to alternative worldviews or how we kind of broaden our perspectives, um, especially if it is difficult to travel or if we feel like we shouldn't um, be traveling, especially in airplanes, how do we um, learn about this? Uh, one of the kind of exciting developments in place theory has been um, the recognition that places are not monolithic and that um, exposure to global perspectives can be found in the local. And so um, every place has multiple cultures and worldviews represented. So I just wanted to respond to that little piece because I think that um, one of the ways that we've often responded to that question is like, it really helps to go travel to a place and experience and immerse ourselves in a different um, culture and worldview. Um, but given the challenges of the Anthropocene, we need to find other ways to do that. Um, and uh, so th that's one thought. And then another um, thought with regard to pedagogical practices. Um, another thing I have students do in my ecology class is I have them um, keep a journal of a practice of paying attention. And so they have to pick a place near their home where they can go outdoors um, and just pay attention to who, what they see, smell, feel, touch. Um, and 
one of the insights that almost always comes back is how difficult that is for students to just stop and just sit for five minutes and pay attention. I mean, some students even talk about just being uncomfortable being outside. We live in Atlanta, so if they have to start in August, it's terrible. But um, but I think that just that sort of sensory experience, I think also is important and tells us a lot. So I try to incorporate that. And the space is open for additional comments and questions. I see a question from Dory in the chat, which I'll respond to quickly. Oh, about, sure. Um, I didn't, yeah, I the students posted all their stories on a publicly available Padlet. And so I will, um, in a minute when I'm not talking, um, post a link to the Padlet so you can see, you can actually click on all the stories. Um, but I'm aware that, even though I have her permission to share that story, I'm a little bit wary of like, it's her creative production. And so, um, but they are available on the public website. So I'll give you the website and you can see all of them. And also, let me just also name that I even know about digital storytelling because of Mary Hess. So, um, and the, I think you might've been in that workshop too, Dory, and maybe others in the room um, that she hosted many years ago, um, where we all learned this uh, pedagogical approach. Oh, I have a question um, to Jennifer. <laughs> um, no. For uh, writing a narrative and thinking way of ecological um, sensitivity, uh, ecological sensitivity, some people are very sensitive to their surroundings, their mood, their own mood or others, while, um, but um, others are not, maybe, <laughs> those, like, so-called um, some people who are not I don't want to say like this, but lack of emotion. <laughs> How do I explain it? Just um, feel themselves. I am uh, not emotional person or something. So is there a um, pedagogical strategy to draw their sensitivity or like um, the sense of reaction? I, th I want to know your answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that we're both trying to deal with the same problem. And in some ways, the problem I think is rooted in how we've conducted environmental education in so many places. We have not sort of leveraged or mobilized the emotions. Um, and in fact, um, in scientific study from enlightenment forward, the emotions have been treated as suspect. And so um, Donna Haraway, who you cite in your paper and her um, her concept of situatedness has actually sometimes um, been used to, to discount what feminist um, scientists have had to offer. And so I think there's a lot of internalized cultural stuff that makes us want to not engage emotionally. Um, but I do think that, I mean, I will say just to, relative to the last thing I said about the sensory experience, I think that more embodied practices sometimes can open um, people to this more um, sensitive, the, to the sensitivity that you're talking about. Um, some students really struggle with the digital storytelling assignment. They don't really want to put their stuff out there. And so they can decide how personal to make their stories. I'm certainly not going to um, uh, force anyone to, you know, go somewhere emotionally that they're not interested in going. But I think that practices that just create a space where um, they can explore those things without being um, sort of graded on the quality of their emotional response, but just um, a space where they can do that is important. I just want to note, um, related to this conversation, the uh, Mary Hess's comment in the chat 
Um, I'll just read it for you, Mary, if that's okay. Uh, let's note that some of the challenges here, particularly in terms of emotions, can be explored or explained through the digital media study awareness that we're experience that that we are experiencing shifts in authority, authenticity, and agency due to digitality. I see Joyce Mercer's hand raised. Oh, but we can't hear you, Joyce. Let's see if I can get everything yeah. on. Great, thanks. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful conversation this is. I, two things that I'm thinking about right now. One is that I really want to encourage you to come to the one o'clock session if you're interested in this emotions topic, because there are two fabulous papers there that deal with um, empathy and peace as topics around our mutual concerns here. Um, but I also just wanted to note that in the turn towards affect in education that we're talking about right now, one of the interesting things this moment uh, presents for us, for we who are theological educators in the room who work in context where somebody else perhaps is teaching pastoral care or more broadly practical theology topics, is the opportunity to make linkages and to, to really um, embody in our teaching the ways in which education is not separated from care, is not separated from community organizing, is not separated from all the other stuff that we're teaching. And what would it look like to think in terms of place-based education that, that works on also practices of care that deeply understand emotion. So bringing some of the helpful theoretical constructs about uh, affect theory and emotional learning together. Maybe we need to be in conversation with colleagues who are teaching in some of these other areas, especially letting the climate issues of our concern be the bridge that can give us a more integrated form of approach pedagogically and just in terms of theological education to these things. So I'm grateful for the conversation. It's generative for me as I'm thinking about that. Thank you. We've just got a final few minutes. Are there any other comments that are just burning? Uh, inside of you in order to be heard. I just want to um, say thanks, Joyce, for that comment. And I think that lots of things happening in the last uh, five to 10 years have made apparent the need to attend to the emotional aspects of learning. 